Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, uh, all of you here at uh, Oxford, and uh, thanks for coming out to this uh, event. It's a pleasure uh, for me, as a Californian, uh, to come back to uh, uh, England, and, and not only because, you see, the weather in California is somewhat uh, boring, <laughs> sunshine all the time, and <laughs> much more interesting here. <laughs> Uh, but also because here in England is where it all began. Now, I, I mean that in two senses. Uh, I might say, uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, Charles Darwin proclaimed <laughs> that uh, mankind and everything else in the living world was the product of evolution by natural selection. Uh, that was in uh, England. Uh, but also, it was in England in uh, 1987 uh, that I uh, came to take up the study of Darwinian evolution and to go on the course uh, of activity which uh, led to the publication of my uh, first book, uh, uh, The Darwin on Trial, uh, uh, the other books that I've written on the subject and this uh, speaking career as followed from my retirement from the University of California as a professor of law. Uh, I came uh, uh, to uh, Britain um, in the fall of 1987 as a visiting professor at University College London, and no teaching duties, just a title and an office, um, and I had to look around uh, for uh, some important research project to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. I told the University of California that I was going to study insurance law. I don't know why I told them that, but I never got around to it. <laughs> Instead, uh, I found uh, that uh, I, I had, uh, hiking in the uh, Welsh border country, uh, before coming on to my position in London, um, uh, I had uh, uh, told my wife, Kathy, who is here, that uh, uh, I felt that I had somehow never found my true vocation, that I had a talent, but that I had essentially wasted it. I had only a career, which successful though it might be, was not the kind of vocation that I needed. So we prayed for um, insight um, that might change this situation. So I, I warn people, um, if you're thinking about uh, praying for insight, be careful. It might happen, and if it does, you will not be able to turn back. Uh, it so happened that uh, uh, I would to go into the office that they had given me at University College uh, from where we lived on Hampstead Heath in London. I would take the bus and uh, get off uh, to stop on Tottenham Court Road and walk over, and each day that I took this route, I, I went past a bookstore they specialized in scientific books. And I noticed that it had in the window two books. Uh, one was the newly published then Richard Dawkins, a masterpiece, uh, The Blind Watchmaker. And, and next to it was another book by a British uh, biochemist uh, working in Australia, Michael Denton, uh, titled Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. So I bought both books and took them home and read them uh, one after the other. Uh, at first, as I read the Dawkins uh, book, it seemed very impressive and persuasive to me. Uh, then I noticed, as I went through its arguments carefully, that in fact, uh, Dawkins never proved a thing that he claimed. He used, for example, the bat with its wonderful echolocation mechanism, using sound like sonar, and, modern terminology to navigate. That certainly is wonderful, and I remember that Dawkins said, well, if natural selection can make the bat, it can make anything. Well, that might be true, but uh, he never actually demonstrated that natural selection ever made a bat. <laughs> it was just assumed, and, and, and he did that with all of the points. He assumed the conclusion. Uh, so uh, 
I, I, I saw that there was something here that I could get my teeth in. I also read Denton's book. And I saw so he made some very marvelous points and arguments, a tremendous skeptical argument about the theory of evolution. Uh, an outstanding book, it made a deep impression on me. But I saw also here that there was something missing. The, as good as the argument was, it failed to take an essential step that was needed to complete his case. Denton uh, accepted uh, basically the way of thinking which led to the theory of evolution. He accepted the principle of the, uh, what is called methodological naturalism, the view that science considers natural causes and explains everything in the world on the basis of natural causes, material causes, and material causes only. And uh, I could see that if one accepted that starting principle, it was hard to escape from the conclusions uh, that followed from that principle. And uh, uh, those were the conclusions that Richard Dawkins was articulating uh, uh, very eloquently. So those were the uh, two books. And after I had digested these and thought about them for some time, I, I said to uh, my wife, uh, Kathy, I think I understand this subject. I think I see what is the uh, real um, a motor of the argument. Um, and uh, I, I could do something with this, but fortunately I'm too intelligent to take it up professionally. It, if I did, it would absorb me completely. It would take over my life. And I would be scorned by many of my colleagues and the United States as scientists with whom I'd previously had a good reputation. They would say, you can't question this theory. Uh, I would be in a battle against the whole world, never ending. And, I'd be consumed by it. So of course, that was irresistible. <laughs> I started the next morning. <laughs> now, uh, everything that I'm going to uh, say to you tonight can be summarized under two main points. The first of these points um, is that uh, uh, Christians, and indeed anyone who is concerned about finding a purpose in life, and a basis for a distinction between good and evil, I hope that's everyone, has to confront uh, this Darwinian theory uh, and uh, uh, even uh, uh, learn uh, to find the weak points in it and uh, state them. So w this is an issue that we, particularly as Christians, must address. We cannot afford to uh, pass by it and assume that all will be well, all will not be well. And the second of my main points is that this is far from a hopeless uh, uh, battle. If we uh, confront uh, the people I call the mandarins of science, you know, those who decide how science will be funded, how it will be presented in the newspapers, and who uh, uh, sponsor Richard Dawkins as their battle axe in dealing with the public, uh, they, they may seem to be of overwhelming power they have all the money in the world. They own the, the newspapers, have unlimited access to the media and the educational system to transmit their propaganda. Um, it, it, it might seem that they're invincible, but this is not the case because there is a logical flaw in their whole system uh, which uh, properly identified and exploited uh, can over time bring down the entire castle. And you know, this has happened before with seemingly impregnable castles. I remember how the Soviet Union appeared uh, 20 years ago. It would always be there with its missiles and its secret police and its concentration camps, uh, a, a permanent fixture on the landscape. And yet, uh, in 1989, the whole proud tower came crashing down of its own internal contradictions and inadequacies. That has happened before, and it can happen again. So those are my two main points. Uh, it's a confrontation we must engage in, and it is a one which is winnable. And the, the reason why uh, I make both of those points and why they're both correct uh, 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 is really the same. The same reason applies uh, to both. Uh, now, in the first place, let us see why it will not do to say that, well, we can accept the scientific claims of Darwinian evolution about the creative power of natural selection and how 
Mankind and everything else is the product of a combination of random variations and survival of the fittest natural selection. But then we can say, we'll, con we'll, we'll concede all of that, but then we'll say it's God's way of creating. <laughs> oh, and we'll put a theistic spin on it at the end and then say, well, we could live with that. This will not do. Uh, because it is not the case that biologists believe in the creative power of natural selection uh, because they have observed it in operation. They have observed uh, random mutation and natural selection accomplishing stupendous feats of creation, uh, like that of the bat. <laughs> no, no, on the contrary, the biologists believe in the theory of uh, creative natural selection uh, and not because of the evidence that they know as biologists, but in spite of the evidence. And that is what I observed when I went through that blind watchmaker for the second time, after being initially bedazzled by the rhetorical brilliance. Uh, that, uh, uh, see, um, when uh, we see natural selection in action actually doing something, as sometimes we do, sometimes the scientists do, it's always something trivial. It is simply a back and forth cyclical variation uh, within fundamentally stable species that aren't going anywhere or changing into anything else. I refer, for, for, for example, uh, 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 to the famous case uh, of the uh, uh, peppered moth. <laughs> Uh, right here in the Midlands of England that was investigated out of All Souls College at Oxford uh, where, uh, by E.B. Ford where uh, it, it was discovered. And of course it is a fact that there was a population variation in the, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, the moths, the, the peppered moths, uh, were uh, overwhelmingly of a light color, a tan. Uh, dur during, later in the 19th century, the population shifted uh, that it became uh, predominantly dark colored. There were light colored moths and dark colored moths in the population all along. It's just that at one time there were more of the one and at another time there were more of the other. And then in the 20th century, the population shifted back to what it had been at the beginning. From, it went from predominantly light colored to predominantly dark colored to predominantly light colored again. Uh, 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 why was this? Well. Uh, uh, scientific investigators uh, theorized and uh, uh, published their results in the 1950s that this, the shift had been due to uh, natural selection, Darwin's mechanism, and specifically that at the beginning, the trees and the forests where the moths lived, or the trunks were light colored. And resting on the light colored trunks during the day, uh, the light colored moths uh, were relatively invisible to the birds who eat them. And so the birds ate the dark colored moths, which were more visible. Hence, the population was predominantly light colored, the birds that were not eaten. Then uh, industrial pollution from the noxious factories of the Midlands uh, uh, made the uh, tree trunks uh, darken and it killed the lichen on the covered the uh, trunks. Uh, and at, at this point, the dark colored moths became better camouflaged. The birds did not eat the dark colored moths. They did eat the light colored moths, which they could see better. And uh, so uh, the, the, the population be became predominantly dark colored because that was what was left. And then uh, later on in the 20th century, air pollution laws allowed the tree trunks uh, to uh, become clean again and to go back to light colored. And uh, the moths uh, that were light colored were better camouflaged again. And so the population shifted uh, again. Now, uh, uh, one can see that this, which is the predominant example of natural selection used in all of the textbooks and museum exhibits. And uh, uh, it, it was actually the first time that anyone had ever observed uh, Darwin's mechanism of natural selection doing anything at all in the wild. The scientists were so impressed that they had found natural selection doing something that they immediately concluded that it could do everything. Uh, now, uh, you don't have to be a powerful master of logic to see that this evidence does not tell us anything at all about how you get moths and trees and birds and scientific observers in the first place. It tells you if you have all of these things uh, already in existence, then it may be that under certain circumstances you'll see more of light-colored moths, and in other circumstances you'll see more of dark-colored moths. But the moths are not uh, uh, turning into uh, eagles, uh, uh, much less elephants. <laughs> Uh, or human beings. In fact, nothing is changing into anything else, and there is no permanent change whatsoever. We have a fundamentally stable species here, which isn't changing in anything, including color, in, on any permanent basis. 
It's just a variation back and forth. So clearly, uh, this is a rather inadequate uh, example to prove that natural selection has any creative power whatsoever. It's not the only example that's used in the textbooks. There's another one with finch beaks and, and some others, but they're all of the same kind, all, all fundamentally the same. Now, um, it, it's a great irony in recent years, if you're familiar with the uh, updates on all of this system, you may know that uh, 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 it happens to be the case that uh, the, the, the moths in question do not rest on tree trunks anyway. <laughs> or, 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 or do not, except rarely, to, do, to one ever find a moth on a tree trunk. <laughs> uh, and the pictures in the textbooks which show uh, the moths on tree trunks or logs, light or dark, being eyed by hungry birds that are used to persuade all of the young people of the world that natural selection has this creative power, those photographs are staged. You know, they glued the moths to the tree trunks to make them. <laughs> now, um, uh, uh, I've always hesitated to make much of that, you know, em rather embarrassing fact, you know, that the moths don't sit on the tree trunks because it wouldn't make any difference if they did. <laughs> now, that isn't the problem with the, uh, uh, the, the example. The problem is that something trivial is used to, some to, to prove something that is profound and uh, amazing that creative power that natural selection can make a bat and indeed a human being can perform the designing work that would otherwise have to be a, associated with with a creator. Now, uh, so there um, uh, 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 is an example of uh, the reasoning uh, that has been used to put across a, 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 a Darwinism. Now, um, it, it would seem that the reasoning is rather obviously inadequate, so, but why does it seem adequate to eminent uh, scientific thinkers, including Professor Dawkins? Well, the reason is that they start with this commitment to the philosophical doctrine I mentioned in connection with Michael Denton, a methodological naturalism, that, that is that for scientific purposes, they say scientists must assume that nature is all there is. There's no creator because the creator would belong to religion and science rejects that. And so uh, there being no creator by this assumption, uh, then uh, how could the creating get done? Well, it would have to be done by some a mechanism that starts with chance, random variations of some kind, because you've removed intelligence from the process. You say it's not true that in the beginning was the word, uh, rather, in the beginning were the particles and the impersonal laws, and it, it then follows that you have to explain everything that follows that in, in, in time, everything that exists, including human beings and all plants and animals, on the basis of some combination of the particles and the laws of the things that were there in the beginning. Now, uh, that being the case, something rather like Darwinian evolution has to be true as a matter of logic, regardless of the evidence. Only the details can be subject to question. The basic principle that nature did its own creating uh, 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 is a sacrosanct. It's a matter of definition. And that being the case, uh, Professor Richard Dawkins can say, as many others have, that if life exists on distant planets where we will never go and make observations, we know that it will have evolved by the Darwinian process. He says that in The Blind Watchmaker and in many lectures. Now, how does he know that? Obviously not from making scientific observations. <laughs> that's, that's the point. You don't need any scientific observations uh, to know that the only thing that is allowed to happen, the only thing that is possible, must be the thing that happened everywhere. Uh, so uh, we see that the foundation of the certainty that natural selection has the creative power Darwinists have claimed for it, or any creative power at all, is founded in an effective atheism. So that, that, uh, that is, it's the absence of God that is the necessary first step in the reasoning. Otherwise, if you don't make that first step, you will notice that natural selection obviously doesn't have any creative power as far as the experimental evidence is concerned. Uh, so this is why it will not do to say that uh, Professor Dawkins and other Darwinists are acceptable, what they say is acceptable insofar as they describe the science of creation by natural selection. It's just when they go the next step and say, and therefore there is no God, that we will object. That is what pe some people do who are called theistic evolutionists. So they say we accept all of the science, but then we say, well, somehow God was behind all of this. See, uh, uh, we, can we can construe natural selection as God's mechanism of creating. 
But you see, this is completely inadequate because uh, the, uh, uh, if Dawkins did not say, and therefore there is no God, he would have made that implicit in his entire argument anyway. He doesn't need to say, he does say it, but he, he doesn't need to, uh, because it's the very first step in his reasoning. And, and, and so therefore, if you are going to question that step and say, well, perhaps there is a creator God after all, then you have to question the whole chain of reasoning that depends upon the absence of that creator. To say that we know that natural selection did the creating because there is no God, and therefore having concluded that natural selection did the creating, we'll say that isn't it nice that that's God's chosen mechanism of, net, of creating. <laughs> now that is completely incoherent thinking, and yet unfortunately a great many intellectual leaders in the Christian world have engaged in precisely that kind of reasoning. And, and, and it is that reasoning that accounts for the fact that Christianity has been so marginalized and discredited in the eyes of thinking people around the world. They can see that Christians who accept you know, natural selection as the effective creator, but then say they believe in God, are allowing into their thinking a, a whole kind of reasoning which utterly undermines and contradicts you know, that, the, the belief in God. So, so they are double-minded men and women and are unstable in all their ways. And this is why they aren't effective. So that, that I think covers my uh, first uh, point, uh, that this is a conflict in which we must engage. You see, we must have the courage to say that we will question the reasoning that is used by Professor Dawkins and others, uh, and uh, uh, we will demand that if they're going to claim that natural selection was capable of doing and did do all the creating, that they must establish this point by scientific evidence, which is to say experiments that show that natural selection actually does have some creative power in combination with random mutation. Merely to claim it on the basis of a philosophical dogma is not scientific, and no matter what the title is of the person who engages in this kind of bad reasoning. Uh, so uh, uh, there it, uh, uh, there it is. This is why we must engage in this cognitive issue. I like to say cognitive rather than intellectual, because intellectual makes it sound to people as if you're talking about something that's only for intellectuals. No, this is for everybody. We all have to think. We all have to know, and that's why it's a cognitive question. Do we know that natural selection did the creating, or does the evidence uh, of science, construed without prejudice, point to the need for a creator? This is the question which we must uh, raise. Now on to the second point uh, of my two, that is the uh, point that, uh, this is a winnable conflict. All we need is the proper strategy, the faith and courage uh, to carry it out, uh, and in fact, we have reason to be very confident that the contradictions in natural selection will be as inescapable as the contradictions in Soviet communism. And the Proud Tower will uh, fall. Uh, and the reason is, again, uh, that uh, to be scientific, the theory of evolution by natural selection uh, must be based on evidence, observation, repeatable experiments. And it is not in any important way. Now, Darwinists will insist that it is, but they are able to do that only because they play a mental trick upon themselves. You see, when you assume that something is true and then just go to the evidence to look for illustrations of what you already believe, then this is a, a process which is properly called pseudoscience. It's make-believe science. And you will always find plenty of evidence to confirm what you assumed at the beginning, because this is the way the mind works. See, this is how it worked with the cousins of the Darwinists, the Marxists and the Freudians. The Marxists started out by assuming that capitalism is an exploitative system, you needed to have communism to replace it, and so everything that they saw confirmed them in what they already believed. If the uh, uh, employers uh, uh, lowered wages, this proved that the communist theory, the Marxist theory, was true. That's just what Marxist theory predicted, they're exploiting the workers. And if they raised wages, this also proved that the theory was true. This is just what the theory predicted, uh, uh, because uh, uh, the, the capitalists were bribing the workers so that they could continue to exploit them. <laughs> Likewise, the Freudians you know, knew that uh, every man uh, had a subconscious wish to 
uh, uh, murder his father and marry his mother, the Oedipus complex. And if anyone denied uh, this uh, fact, uh, then um, uh, that proved that he was lacking in insight and needed psychoanalysis. Uh, so uh, uh, you would see that, that and now, and in fact, this is not just my opinion, uh, Freud and Marx have been exposed again and again, influential as they were at mid-century, the time of the peppered moth papers, uh, the, uh, mid, mid 20th century, uh, they've, they've lost all their scientific standing right now. And you only find uh, you know, devoted Marxists at, at uh, uh, protected uh, uh, enclaves where uh, like uh, uh, Oxford University and the University of California at Berkeley. <laughs> Not out where the, the, the real world shines its light harshly on bad thinking. And so uh, uh, you see why I say that this is an, a winnable a battle. And, and indeed, to win the conflict, I developed uh, what I call my wedge theory. That's not a terribly original idea, to tell you the truth, but uh, I, I think it may be a good one. Um, I, I said that in, what we need to do in order to overcome you know, the tyranny of uh, the Darwinist thought uh, is to approach it um, in, 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 as we would approach, let us say, a heavy log that is in the way, in the, in the road ahead of us when we're trying to proceed on a mountain path with our car. We can't go around the log because we'd fall off a cliff on the one side or run into a wall on the other. We can't go over it. All that we can do uh, to proceed is to split that log. For that, we need a wedge with a sharp edge and then a thicker flange you know, behind it. So we drive the wedge, if we need to find a crack in the log, drive the wedge into a crack, see, and then gradually split the uh, log. And this uh, uh, proceeds this way in my uh, uh, plan, which is uh, set out in detail in my book, uh, The Wedge of Truth. Uh, the, um, uh, my own work has been the sharp edge of the wedge. So I, I, I attempt to bring the most basic ideas before the largest uh, public we can, and not only in the Christian world, uh, but also in the secular world and the universities, of both of which I speak at. You see, and, and, and I start out, the crack in the log is the difference between two definitions of science that are pre prevalent in our culture, that are contradictory, but people don't realize that because they're, they're not taught to think about it. They're taught just to accept what they're told. Uh, but you see, we have two definitions of science in our culture. One of them is that science is the business of making careful observations, doing experiments, uh, recording the data, and then following the data wherever it points without prejudice. Science is unprejudiced investigation under the first definition. That's good. We should be impressed with that kind of science. But under the second definition, which trumps the first in cases of conflict, science is the business of giving explanations of everything in terms of natural causes, regardless of the evidence. That's why Richard Dawkins doesn't need any evidence to say that Darwinian evolution would have produced any life that exists on other planets if there were any. Uh -huh. Uh, 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 it, it's why slight evidence, like the, the peppered moth that doesn't really prove anything important, seems overwhelmingly uh, I important to prove the entire theory to the people whose minds are confused and indoctrinated by this second definition of science. See, and that, that's why they think they have overwhelming evidence. But in, uh, yeah, so, see, uh, uh, now that, that, that was the first. This is the entering wedge. Now behind the entering wedge, I have my colleagues Persons like uh, William Dembski, the mathematician, and Michael Behe, a, a biochemistry professor at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania and author of the magnificent book, Darwin's Black Box. You see, who show that if you look at the evidence impar impartially without this prejudice in favor of naturalism or any prejudice at all, uh, you will see that the evidence tends to point you in the direction of an intelligent cause in biology. Uh, Professor Dawkins himself concedes very willingly, and to his credit, that uh, the biological cell is not the simple blob of jelly-like protoplasm that Darwin thought it. It is a masterpiece of miniaturized complexity that makes a spaceship seem very low-tech. Uh, uh, each cell, a bacterium is a single cell, and you and I each have trillions of cells working together in marvelous harmony in our bodies. Uh, uh, Professor Dawkins concedes that each one of those cells contains more information in terms of the program that makes its uh, complex processes work, more information than all of the volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica put together. Now, you see, encyclopedias are not written by 
chance arrangements of letters or by repeatable natural laws. The arrangement of the letters that gives the meaning to the message in the encyclopedia or other book. It could be the Bible, the plays of Shakespeare, or even a humbler product like one of my books or <laughs> Professor Dawkins's. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter what the subject is or the quality. Now, any book uh, has to contain an arrangement, a com very complex arrangement of letters produced by intelligence. And much the same reasoning can be applied in science uh, to the arrangement of the chemical letters, the nucleotides, and the DNA that that, that encode a message which directs the synthesis of proteins. Uh, we know also that scientists who are every bit as atheistic as Mr. Dawkins uh, spend their uh, professional careers searching the skies with radio telescopes for mes messages that come from uh, uh, space aliens. See, they're looking for space aliens because they like space aliens. They're not looking for God because they don't like God. They don't want God to exist. But now, if you get a lot of radio noise, noise out of space, how do you know that if it is or is not a message from some intelligent being out there? Well, the answer is that you use exactly the same methods that we in the intelligent design movement in biology, a movement that was founded after the publication of my first uh, book, uh, Darwin on Trial, with professors Dembski and uh, Behe and uh, others uh, participating. You see, see uh, we know that certain kinds of combinations are produced only by intelligence. Uh, that is, uh, complex arrangements of letters uh, that contain a message. And that's exactly what uh, Carl Sagan and his you know, colleagues would use to uh, decode a, 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 a message from an intelligent alien. They would know that it was a message from intelligence if it contained a complex arrangement of letters encoding a message. It's the same way you can know that what might seem a cryptanalysis can see what seems like a jumble of letters and numbers and find out it's a secret message from a spy. It's much the same technique, which if applied to the information in the cell, tells you to look for an intelligent designer that produced the vast amount of information that's in that cell. See, now you see, this is a rather simple line of reasoning, uh, but it is forbidden in science. That you can, you can use this line of reasoning if you're looking for space aliens, which the ma powerful mandarins of science are willing to allow space aliens to exist, but not if you're looking for God because these mandarins think that they are so powerful that they can legislate God out of existence. And so you, you, you aren't allowed to look for this. Now, it's, it's rather uh, distressing. Uh, it's not so surprising that the atheist mandarins, like uh, Professor Dawkins, refuse to allow you to think about the possibility of an intelligence in biology. They forbid it. And, and, and with weapons of ridicule and intimidation, try to prevent people from doing this and use their power to keep you know, any mention of this out of the press and the educational system. Uh, but, but it's understandable that they do this. After all, they're atheists. What is a bit less understandable is that there are Christians, church-going Christians, uh, called theistic evolutionists, many of them band together in organizations who will do the same thing. They say, you may not consider that the evidence of biology points to the need for a creator. That's forbidden, because the definition of science won't allow it. And so you, you, you'll find these individuals often allied with the atheists uh, in, in inserting into Christian thought something which is profoundly unchristian and atheistic. And this, too, leads to a great weakening. We, we, we saw the, the perhaps the most astounding example of this kind of thing in the joint a letter that was published in the newspapers uh, 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 some months ago, a letter signed both by uh, Richard Dawkins um, and uh, uh, the Bishop of Oxford. <laughs> so, this is uh, the ultimate uh, in a, uh, uh, effective apostasy, you see, to, to say, and, and, and one can say, you know, and even convince oneself that one is sincere. I really do believe in God. I go to church on Sunday. I take communion. And yet one's thinking can be profoundly atheistic. And this happens to people even without their realizing. You see, because the educational system is such that it is directed to keeping them confused in this way. Darwinian evolution is one of the very few subjects where a whole educational apparatus is aimed at keeping people from learning. Uh, keeping them confused, uh, and so it is. And, and this is why uh, all we have to do is to have the insight to realize you know, these basic principles, the faith to stand up for what we know to be true, uh, and the willingness to educate ourselves and our young people, our young people and also our old people, <laughs> but, but especially our young people, the next generation, to be able to think through these issues.
We don't need any counter dogmatism of our own. We don't need to drum some formula into their minds to re you know, re re repeat like uh, automatons. That's not what we need in the Christian world now. We need independent, fearless thinkers who will challenge these uh, dogmas and think them through straight. And of course, they'll challenge our dogmas too. And that's good for us. It's painful, but you can get to like it. <laughs> And, 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 and so this is why when I, I, I wrote a resolution for the United States Senate on you know, this very topic, I, I said that the important thing in science education is that it should teach students the difference between the testable theories and data of science on the one hand and uh, philosophical claims made in the name of science on the other. Because right? I said that's all we need. We don't need to teach creation science or intelligent design. We just need to teach evolution honestly and that'll be enough. And that resolution passed the United States Senate by a vote of 98 to 1. All the liberals voted for it. Yes, John Kerry, John Edwards, and Senator Ted Kennedy. They didn't, I think, realize what they were doing, but <laughs> they voted for it. You see, and, 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 and so likewise, you see, that, that, that is the principle of intellectual freedom, Senator Santorum said, was the whole purpose of his amendment. Um, and, and that's the case. All we need is intellectual freedom, intellectual honesty, and faithful courage to stand up for good thinking and logic uh, and, and not to be bamboozled by the kind of claims that bamboozled me a bit the first time I read, read them in, in, in The Blind Watchmaker, but that I could see through on a second reading. So uh, uh, that's uh, why this is not only a necessary conflict, uh, but uh, uh, a winnable one. And with that, um, uh, 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 I can get to the part of the evening that I really enjoy. Uh, uh, the question period, I welcome uh, questions, of whether they be friendly or hostile in intent. I'm always glad to explain myself uh, further and justify, uh, uh, and uh, 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 because, uh, as you will see, we have nothing to fear. From open inquiry and debate and investigation, it's bound to work towards bringing out the truth, and that's all I, I want to uh, further. So uh, let's now take this first round of questions before we...